Hello, everyone, and welcome to this integrated DNA technologies webinar on planning and executing siRNA experiments, good practices for optimal results. My name is Hans Packer, and I'll be serving as the moderator for today's presentation. And the presentation today will be given by my friend and colleague Garrett, Garrett Reddig, who is a research scientist here at IDT in the molecular genetics group. And Garrett has his PhD in pharmacy and medicinal chemistry from the University of Iowa, where he has studied synthetic peptide delivery systems for plasma DNA and siRNA, both in vitro and in vivo. And at IDT, Garrett has been involved in high throughput screening of siRNAs in vitro. He has also recently co-authored a comprehensive review on siRNA in vivo, which is published in Molecular Therapy. Garrett's presentation today should last about 25 minutes. And we'll follow that presentation with Garrett taking questions from attendees. Uh, if you have a question during the presentation, you can ask that by typing it into the questions box, which is located at the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, at the end of the presentation, then I will read your questions to Garrett. As attendees, you have been muted, but you can ask your questions at any time by typing into that questions box. Also, if you need to leave early today or you want to revisit this webinar later to pick up some extra details or something that you think you might have missed or, you know, want to really make sure that you know or showing you, we are recording the presentation and that will be made available in the next few days uh, on our website, which is www.idtdna.com. And you'll find that under our support and education tab. And there's a video library link within that tab. We also have a YouTube channel, which is www.idt.youtube.com forward slash IDT DNA bio. And at both of those locations, the video library and the YouTube channel, you can find, you'll be able to find this video as well as a series of other things that we've done in the past on qPCR, next generation sequencing, RNAi, and a host of topics. So uh, with that, I am going to turn this presentation over to Garrett for his talk on planning and executing siRNA experiments, good practices for optimal results. Garrett? Thank you, Hans, for the introduction. Good afternoon, and welcome to the webinar. Much of what is going to be presented here is probably not new, probably not new to you, but really are considerations that we have found in our work uh, to be important over the course of several years of doing high throughput screening of DSIRNAs in vitro work that we've done here in-house. So even though the functional analysis by mRNA knockdown using siRNAs is quite commonplace and routine in many labs, there are many RNAi-related experiments that do fail uh, due to diversion from simple good practices that can create confounding results like false positives and false negatives. The hope is that this webinar will review the steps leading to successful siRNA experiments. And those steps include understanding the target transcript, siRNA selection, choosing the cell type, validating the assay, and finally including all these appropriate biological controls into a final experiment. If you're working in RNAi, this slide is probably unnecessary and it's probably commonly understood that your standard exogenous siRNA is a 21 double-stranded RNA with two 3' prime overhangs that is incorporated then into the risk assembly. Risk jettisons the sense strand, leaving the guide strand to target the risk with the AGO2 cleavage properties to the target mRNA for target recognition and cleavage. DSIRNAs or dicer substrate siRNAs work in a similar way, although these are 25 mer sense strand with two DNA bases at the three prime end, at the blunt end, and then a three prime overhang on the antisense strand. So a 25, 27 double stranded RNA molecule that is, as the name implies, a substrate for dicer. So these exogenous double stranded RNAs come into the cell, are recognized by dicer, and are processed down to the cognate siRNA or 21 double-stranded uh, RNA molecules. Dicer then, and what we found to be important in terms of potency advantage for dicer substrates is that dicer is involved in the handoff to risk, um, where then, once again, the sense strand is jettisoned 
the antisense strand guides risk towards the targeted mRNA for cleavage as well. And then specifically showing what we're talking about with the dicer substrate siRNAs, the top sequence in blue shows the complementary sequence to the antisense strand. The antisense strand is shown in red, and as I mentioned, there are the three prime overhangs on the antisense strand blunt ended at the three prime end of the sense strand with two DNA bases to force a preference of antisense strand loading. And under dicer processing, this is chewed back down to the cognate 21 mer. And a little bit more specifically, Dicer, the PAS domain of Dicer recognizes that three prime end of the antisense strand and acts as a, then a molecular ruler of sorts to chew out the, and dice out, as the name implies, the 21 nucleotide double stranded siRNA. So, really, what we're hoping to address here is looking at this type of result, which is PCR amplification plot, qPCR plot in which we show untreated controls and a delta CQ of 3.3, um, which would imply 90% knockdown of the target mRNA in the case of siRNA-treated cells targeting the gene of interest. The question really is, can we validate and can we incorporate the appropriate controls to know that this perceived 90% knockdown is real, that it's not some sort of false positive by induced toxicity or, or the like. And hopefully we've incorporated here a strategy to address any, any shortcomings in the experiment that may lead to such false positives. They include in the things that we're going to talk about are identifying the target gene of interest, using appropriate tools for DSI RNA selection, also making proper considerations for cell line selection, optimizing the experimental conditions, and then finally carrying out a controlled pilot experiment that will lead to then optimized conditions and experiments going forward for knockdown of your gene of interest. So that's the strategy. The first part of the strategy then is identifying the target gene of interest. So this graph shown in this slide is an example of one of our high throughput uh, screening experiments. This is the result of a STAT3, human STAT3 screen that we carried out in HeLa cells. <clears throat> um, in this case, it was about 250 DSI RNAs that were transfected into HeLa cells at one nanomolar. And our assay uh, for this particular experiment and for most of our high throughput screens, assay of choice is qPCR. You'll see that we're looking at STAT3 knockdown is measured by two different qPCR assays. The 5 prime assay shown and indicated uh, as the percent RNA remaining by the blue markers is shown geographically on the x-axis by the blue line and then the 3 prime assay positioned more towards the 3 prime end and the 3 prime UTR is represented by the locations represented by the red line on the x-axis and the data is shown by the red markers. And what you'll see throughout this particular screen is pretty good agreement between knockdown as measured by each of the 5 prime and the 3 prime assay at each DSI RNA location. And this is fairly similar to what we would see looking at a random screen like this, a random walk, if you will, of DSI RNAs across a particular gene of interest that you have some areas that show quite good and potent knockdown and some that aren't so good. One reason that we mentioned and one re reason that we utilize two qPCR assays is highlighted hopefully in this example here. You can see that there is indeed assay discordance. This is a different gene of interest. This is not STAT3. This is a one nanomolar screen of DSRNAs and HeLa cells of a different gene of interest. But you can quickly look towards the three prime end of this graph and see assay discordance. This means that the mRNA that is being measured by the five prime assay is not showing the knockdown in terms of the red markers as the 
uh, as the mRNA that's measured by the more three prime assay or by the blue marker. So there's a clear divergence here. We suspect, and it's been shown, that this is due to uh, retained fragments by mRNA and may have to do, in fact, with the secondary structure and the cleavage of the AGO2 happening and not any uh, that exonuclease degradation of the entire transcript. And so for that reason, we feel it's important to have geographically spaced two PCR assays. Secondly, in understanding the transcript, then is looking at and identifying transcriptional variants. This example shown in this slide is uh, showing specifically the variants of mouse gap DH. And keep in mind that variants 1 through 5 can differ in abundance and that this can be a cell line dependent factor. But I think once you consider that, it's, it may be easy at that point to see that if you have a qPCR assay located uh, where it's denoted here in green and a DSI RNA located where it's shown here in gray, that transcript variance and relative abundance of those variants can really affect the results in both a qPCR assay dependent and DSI RNA dependent, location dependent fashion. And then finally, species variation. Uh, it's important to keep in mind the scope of the line of experiments that you're going to pursue and how that might relate to cell lines that are used in vitro, particular mouse models that you might be advancing to, or possible further experiments in clinical trials. In the collaborations that we've undertaken, we have been screening oftentimes human mouse common DSI RNAs as well as only human unique and mouse unique as the case may be DSI RNA sequences. This is really all dependent on the intended arc of the experiments in which uh, in many cases it, that we've worked with are targeted uh, for therapeutically relevant DSI RNAs that would be included in clinical trials. So certainly depending on where your experiments start and end, the interspecies alignment of mRNA sequence can affect the experimental directions. Then we move into selecting an effective siRNA or dsRNA selection. After the discovery of siRNA and that phenomenon, there were papers such as this that published by Reynolds in Nature Biotech in 2004, the so-called Reynolds rules that represent these sort of heuristic rules, um, in this case specifically addressing GC content, the location of an siRNA, where to position it relative to the start codon, and also, of course, performing BLAST homology searches to avoid off-target effects. Similar things discussed by Tuchel in 2002. Here you see the mention of the two DNA bases to be incorporated into the three prime overhangs of siRNAs. And then the, this NAR paper from 2004 where we take gets into discussing the really the polarity or the thermodynamic polarity, the AU content or the GC content at the five prime or three prime end of the sense strand or antisense strand. It's, the case may be. <clears throat> but as this has advanced, we've gone to more uh, to develop algorithms based on a support vector machine, and, and certainly others have done this, and here at IDT, this is what we have done. We have used much of our high throughput screening data in order to train an SVM or do machine learning in order for then uh, to develop an algorithm that would predict the most potent DSI RNAs. So shown on this slide is our pre-designed DSI RNA tool, a selection tool which includes algorithm selection, selected potent DSI RNAs that in this pre-designed case have been bioinformatically screened for off-target effects. And then you're able to select your gene of interest from uh, amongst 25,000 genes across seven species. At that point then IDT will send you this trifecta kit uh, which includes the predicted three most potent DSI RNAs against your specific target. 
if your sequence of interest does not happen to fall within the parameters of our pre-designed library, you can enter a sequence of interest into the box shown there on this screen and have the tool um, in real time design the most potent DSIRNA for your specific sequence of interest. And then back to the pre-design library, the guarantee of those DSI RNAs that we send you, of those three, two of them should show greater than 70% knockdown in a 10 nanomolar transfection if, of course, the experiment is well controlled, including the appropriate positive and negative controls. To follow up on this, we recently undertook a study of 50 genes of random choice to confirm whether or not we were able to meet this guarantee. We found in our in-house screening that 42 out of those 50 genes, there were two of the first three as, as anticipated or as noted in the guarantee that would give greater than 70% knockdown at 10 nanomolar. And when we looked further into the eight that were outside of those boundaries, we found at least three DSI RNAs within the top 10, and we tested 10 in this case, that gave the appropriate or the guaranteed knockdown at a 10 nanomolar transfection. The next thing to consider is cell line selection, certainly an important factor in developing a good set of in vitro RNAi experiments. Uh, there are online databases like the one shown here. This graph is taken from BioGPS that will give a nice expression profile of targets across several different, in this case, cell types, tissue types, even specific cell lines in some cases. In this example, it's showing the abundance, relative abundance of human gap DH. You see relatively high abundance if you look through in the various muscle tissues. This can be quite a useful resource to help, at least at the outset, guide cell line selection. Perhaps a more straightforward approach is to do a literature search and see what others have done that are studying a similar thing. And of course, if you do that and look at the methods section, you have the opportunity to maybe glean more detailed information. In this case, you see that the group is studying gap DH in mouse fibroblasts and looking at knockdown. You find out that they're plating 12,500 cells per unit area, and you can get an idea of what their assay method is, as well as what their dosing range is, in this particular case, up to 50 nanomolar transfections. And then assay validation. Selecting and validating an assay is obviously an essential step to RNAi experiments. In this example, we're showing, once again, a qPCR amplification plot with untreated controls from our selected cell line that, in this case, fall directly in the middle of the linear range of detection for the qPCR assay, and that standard curve is spanning from a million copies per reaction down to 10 copies per reaction. It's also noteworthy that qPCR does not have to be the assay of choice. Uh, we just happen to prefer it for our purposes, but we could also imagine using Western blotting, BDNA assays, um, northern blots, phenotypic uh, endpoint assays as well. For qPCR assays, IDT offers our prime time product line. Much like the pre-designed DSI RNA selection tool, here you can come in, specify a gene target, choose your species of interest, and select whether or not you want to utilize a 5' prime nuclease assay, which would include a probe, of course, or if you're going to use an intercalating dye like Cyber or Eva Green, uh, we would ship you just the primers themselves, the DNA primers for that particular assay. But you can see the assay for, assays listed uh, for the search results below for HPRT1, for human HPRT1. And one thing that the results return then is the exon spanning location for these particular assays. And then one more thing along the lines of assay validation that we always like to consider, and this is both a transcript-dependent and potentially protein-dependent 
and on top of that cell line dependent factor is the time course of transfection or the time course of mRNA knockdown. In this particular example, we're looking at HPRT knockdown in HeLa cells in a 10 nanomolar transfection. And what you can observe, it, observe in the left panel is that mRNA knockdown as quantified by qPCR is maximal at 12 hours after transfection. This is much sooner than the maximal knockdown of HPRT protein as measured by Western blotting which in this case is 72 hours. And then further optimizing transfection conditions. This particular graph represents the exact sort of experiment that we typically would carry out when looking at either a new target or trying to screen a new target in a new cell line. We'll line up a panel of, in this case it's four, but it could be several different lipid reagents, polymers, dendromers, et cetera, to try and introduce our, our standard positive control, which is the HPRT DSIRNA, into cells and see what the knockdown levels are. And then hopefully we would optimize those over a time course and then use that particular set of conditions going forward in the experiments. So in all of our high throughput screening work, we traditionally utilize the three negative controlled scrambled DSIRNAs that are shown on this slide along with the HPRT positive controlled DSIRNA that I have mentioned uh, that's shown at the bottom, the sequence is shown at the bottom of the slide. Additional parameters that should be looked at in advance of screening and oftentimes we do look at if, if we're once again entering new territory in terms of gene target or reagent that we're using or cell line that we're screening in. We'll look at, as mentioned, various transfection reagents, the dose response of the reagent and how that impacts cell toxicity or knockdown or delivery, transfection efficiency. Also we'll look at cell seeding density because of course that can impact the toxicity and also the transfection efficiency. And that's a cell line dependent function. We'll also look at the dose response of the DSIRNA, probably test various transfection reagents in a forward or a reverse transfection. And as we mentioned, we will look at the time course certainly to see where at least mRNA knockdown is maximal because we're choosing to measure mRNA by qPCR. And then finally, whether or not the reagent, uh, the ratio of the reagent to the DSIRNA has an impact on the transfection efficiency as well. So all of these factors would then come together in hopefully a pilot experiment that would be done to ensure that all of the negative controls do not show any knockdown in any of the qPCR assays that are, that are used as endpoint assays, that the HPRT DSIRNA in a dose response fashion would show target specific knockdown and that our DSIRNA of interest would likewise demonstrate specific knockdown. This would all be done of course with biological and technical replicates and this is you know what we would what we would do before entering into a high throughput screen is carry out a pilot experiment such as this to validate our to validate our controls, to validate our assays, and validate our processes. So finally, in summary, we would carry through in each case when entering into screening for knockdown of a gene of interest. We would identify the gene of interest and various factors that may be in play there, look at appropriate DS DSIRNA selection tools, optimize experimental conditions, choose a cell line, and optimize the transfection conditions within that cell line, and then finally carry out that controlled pilot experiment that would result hopefully going forward in optimized experiments for measuring knockdown of a gene of interest. I would like to mention that we have additional educational resources at the IDT link listed at the top of this page. In addition, the second link shows 
would take you to the various design tools that I've mentioned. And then finally, uh, you can reach our customer care team at the email listed below. And with that, I would certainly take any questions you might have about the presentation or about siRNA experiments in vitro. All right. Uh, thanks for that presentation, Garrett. That was great. Um, so that's kind of an overview of the RNAi siRNA um, experimental protocol for in vitro. Um, it's obviously a very nuanced area, and there's lots of things that you know need to be considered. So Garrett has tons of experience, and if you have some questions that you want to ask him that uh, might help you with your experiments, now would be the time to do so. And you can type those into the questions box in the GoToWebinar software. So you'll see the questions thing. It has a little up arrow if you're on a Mac, or it has a plus sign if you're on a PC. Just click on that. It'll pop it out and make it larger, and you can type your question into it. Um, so at this time, I will start with the questions that we already have. All right, so we offer the, the kit, Garrett, of the, the DSI RNAs. Um, do we offer any design help for the qPCR assays for the, for the RNAi experiments? Yeah, there is there is design help there. Uh, the the end user can go in and use our primer quest program to kind of position those primers and probe as they would uh, as they might prefer. Otherwise, certainly our customer care team uh, can give assistance with uh, with prime time assay design. Okay, here's a question. This is a transfection question here. I don't know, can you comment specifically on figuring out the dose used for transfections with TKO or RNAi max reagents? I can comment on RNAi max because that ends up being what we primarily have used in our high throughput screening. So the dose of the dose of, of the sRNA was a question hands up. I, I, I believe so. Yeah. So typically, we're screening anywhere from as high as 10 nanomolar in our positive control. Um, but typically, for our genes of interest, we're screening anywhere from 1 nanomolar down to 1 picomolar. And we're seeing, in our most potent dsRNAs, good knockdown as low as 1 picomolar, if not lower. And good meaning in some cases, 90% knockdown still at those low doses. Okay. And these would be done in HeLa cells in a reverse transfection situation as well. All right. So the next question is, is there any particular reason why when you presented this that you selected the cell line? You have that in your workflow after you select the... Uh, the gene assay? After you just, select the assay of, of interest? Just in your workflow, you had mentioned, you first talk about the gene that you're interested in and picking your, your DSI RNA assay, and then eventually you come around to the, uh, okay, to the yeah. cell line. If there was a purpose for that workflow. Good question. Be <laughs> I can understand why you would, uh, in some cases, want to select your cell line first, and then select the assay. For our purposes with qPCR, um, we can almost always look at, initially look at a qPCR assay and get some level of amplification of our target of interest from any cell line. But that expression level may not be enough for screening, but we can then take that amplicon, clone it in, at least go through and validate our qPCR assay. So now um, we have our linearized plasma standards where, where I can show um, back on the slide here, where we have a million down to 10 copies per reaction. So we've got that in hand and validated the assay as, as efficient uh, with even spacing in between these uh, tenfold dilutions, hopefully 3.3 uh, CQ, delta CQ in between each to give us a 100% efficient qPCR assay. 
But we have this in hand before then we start going through a panel of excuse me, a panel of cell lines and in some cases that's what happens is we search through every um, cell line that we have in stock and frozen stocks of mRNA or frozen stocks of cDNA that we've isolated from various cell lines and then we'll go through and compare them to the standard curve and see where at least the untreated controls from those particular cell lines that we're screening fall into the linear range of our, of our qPCR assay. And so that's why in this workflow I have that first but that's a good question okay um so i it looks like i maybe didn't get all of that first question too about the well second question about the the transfection reagents uh the person was asking about the data for the slide that you had with the tko and rnai max reagents on there and wanted to know what the doses were on that oh the amounts sorry the yeah amount the reagent that were included, or otherwise it's, it's 10 nanomolar transfection of HPRT. And then oftentimes what we'll do is just use the manufacturer's recommended amounts, or maybe if we have um, some past experience with this cell line with a different target, we'll have some historical frame of reference for the amount of reagent that we put in. Um, but that's going to be scaled, you know, this is a 24-hour transfection it's not noted on this slide whether or not this was, for instance, a 24 well plate. I'm guessing it was probably a 24 well plate. Um, but you know, if it's 96 well plate, all those factors go into optimizing. So uh, I wouldn't read too much into the volumes of the reagents noted here. Is the uh, is the 10 nanomol though? That's the dose of the the siRNA, right? 10 nanomolar is the dose of the siRNA. You got it. Okay, great. Um, let's see. All right, so this person, um, they're asking for some genes that they've been testing, no matter what they try. So if they position DSI RNAs at several different locations, they're not getting any knockdown. And they're saying that the positive controls and other genes work very well, and they're wondering if there's any explanation for that or what they should be doing. And they also mentioned that they are working with parasites that and are using electroporation as their delivery method. Hmm. Interesting. I, I, you know, the first step that we would go to, and what we've done in the past, is to go to a different assay method. So, for instance, if we had a, a knockdown event that we suspected but couldn't observe by qPCR, in the past we've gone to northern blotting and shown that actually when we position a probe uh, appropriately, that we do indeed show that that AGO2 dependent cleavage is happening. And maybe our qPCR assays aren't positioned appropriately to, to actually show us any knockdown. And so without knowing too many details, you know, I would look for different assay methods first. And of course, you can always do upfront controls of you know, doing it during the electroporation, it, can you fluorescently label the siRNA to make sure it's actually getting into the cells? And um, but it sounds like they've probably already done that sort of thing if they're getting knocked down of of other genes. And so perhaps there's also this could fall under the heading of um, transcriptional variants. And we have seen we have seen cell line dependent um, variants of transcripts that have really confounded our results and once we move to a different cell line where those variants were no longer present then all of a sudden so so perhaps the uh, assay was measuring an abundant cell line in or sorry an abundant transcript that the srna for whatever reason was not hitting when we've seen this kind of thing we've moved to a different cell line where the literature suggested in our own our own look into it suggested that um, the transcriptional variants were not as, as severe within that particular cell line, then all of a sudden we saw nice consistent results, whereas when we were in, in this case it happened to be 2,2-RV1 cells, so many things with the transcripts were messed up that we just were not getting a positive readout. So that could also be a factor. So from all of that, do you have like any idea like what would be a good next step for them to do for those genes? Would it be something, I mean, maybe maybe at this point, like if they're having that difficulty, maybe it would be best if they called and had a conversation with somebody in you know, the technical that, that support. You know, that might be a great option, really, so we could think about things together and get a little more information about 
what they're encountering and what they're trying to do. Yeah, that's that's always that's always a good option. Okay. All right. All right, so this person is going to ask a question. I think we kind of covered this earlier. Um, in the, in, so we've done another round of this webinar earlier today. So apologies for making that not clear. <laughs> uh, this person's observing that the cell lines that we're talking about here are relatively easy to transfect, but historically T lymphocytes are difficult to transfect. Uh, do you have any uh, insight on transfecting T cell leukemias or even untransformed T cells. Right, good question. You're right. We we talked about this this in the morning session too. Um, you know, because our most of our work has been well, just done for two reasons. One, to find a potent dsRNA for collaborators, and two, has been to develop as big of a mountain of data as we can with which to train our algorithm. We have intentionally worked in, as the questioner notes, easy to use, easy to transfect cell lines so we get a good result. So that we do see the stratification of different knockdown efficiencies with different DSIRNAs. Um, and once again, for that data, then to go into the training set for algorithm development. So in-house, we have actually not done those types of uh, more stringent tests of transfection efficiency and hard to transfect cell lines that the questioner is asking about. Right. So we don't have very much, if really any, in-house expertise on that kind of thing. And we do not currently offer any uh, transfection tools or reagents right now, correct? That, that is correct, yeah. Yes. So all of our stuff is based on testing um, though that equipment or uh, those reagents from other manufacturers. All right. Again, another specific question. Is there any method that you would know of to knock down a specific gene in macrophages? I'm guessing macrophages are probably not too different as far as transfection ability. Yeah, we've had a couple um, macrophage cell lines that we've looked at in the past. What was specifically the question? A gene that could be knocked down? They wanted to know if you had a good method for knocking down a specific gene in macrophages. Well, by and large, with the the gene that we use, the positive control that we use in HPRT for any any human, mouse, or rat cell line that we're looking at, and then the variable is, of course, which transfection reagent that we use to get it in. Um, I don't recall which specific macrophage cell line that we have used, and beyond that, I don't recall off the top of my head which reagents we use for that macrophage. But certainly, I could get that information for the for the questioner. Okay. So, Garrett, what happens if when somebody orders the uh, the trifecta kit with the three DSI RNAs that have been bioinformatically chosen? What happens if they get those and they don't work to the uh, advertised? efficiency? That's a good question. Um, like I talked about earlier, there were, of the genes that we looked at, 42 out of 50 did meet that requirement. But if they don't, and you can show us that um, you had positive controls that were working and negative controls that were looking good, and, and this does happen, then we'll send you three more DSI RNAs that um, that are next up on the list is predicted most potent to test in your experiment and will continue to send you uh, and help you troubleshoot with three more DSI RNAs as, as the line of experiments dictates. But we'll hopefully in the end get in your hands at least two DSI RNAs that meet that guarantee. Okay, here's another question. What are the things that I need to consider in order to minimize off-target effects for my siRNA? So the first thing would be um, to order, hopefully, from our pre-designed library, which our sequence verified and bioinformatically screened, to not have uh, those off-target effects because they've got um, they're not allowed if they've got uh, less than two 
mismatches, I believe, in the core 19. Um, but those are all bioinformatically screened. Likewise, optimizing the transfection conditions and getting the most potent dsRNA is the way that we found to be most successful. That is to say, introducing the least amount of dsRNA as possible to get your desired result. And that happens through optimizing conditions. Like I was saying, we get sometimes as, as high as 90% knockdown with as little as one picomolar transfection. Okay. So for qPCR, you have uh, a lot of considerations that you have to take into account for the, the housekeeping genes that you use for normalization and stuff. And those things aren't exactly relevant here, but are there special considerations that you have to consider for the housekeeping genes that you choose to, or, you know, your controls for the siRNA experiments? Right, right. So the housekeeping genes that we use are um, HPRT, which also happens to be our positive control, and then uh, SFRS9, which is noted in all these slides. Um, and we utilize those because in our standard cell lines that we screen in, mostly HeLa cells and, and, and mouse, it's HEPA-1-6, these particular targets or these particular genes give us reasonable expression levels within the linear range of our standard curve. And we've got uh, known positive dsRNAs against HPRT, and we also know that uh, we've consistently not seen these targets, these housekeeping genes, affected up or down across really any of the over 40 genes that we screen now with many times greater than 400 dsRNAs against a target. And so we sort of empirically have tested these and feel that they're fairly bulletproof for our housekeeping purposes. But yeah, maybe there's uh, more information specifically about that on some of our uh, qPCR webinars, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm sure we have some additional information on that elsewhere on the website. Um, so a great follow-up question to that would be, what is the negative control that we use for the DSI RNA experiments? So these negative controls that we utilize, I assume they're talking about these sequences here? I would guess so, yes. Okay, yeah. Yeah, these are just scrambled negatives that have been shown not to blast uh, to the antisense strand is not complementary to anything in the transcriptome. And likewise with the housekeeping genes, we've used these reliably uh, over the course of several high throughput screens and have shown that they've not been affected by DSIRNA dosing of, of any sort. Um, so reliable, but it's important to include, obviously, a negative control that is an actual uh, molecule that you know might be able to trigger the same non-specific double-stranded RNA effects as your positive control or your dsRNA targeting gene of interest. Are these uh, are these different for each species, Garrett? We use these interchangeably. These are blasted against both mouse and human, and our negative controls for both. And I believe we're at, but I'm not 100% sure on that. And these are available to people, these sequences? These are available, you know, to be honest with you, I'm not sure if they're available explicitly on our website or which one. One of them is included in the trifecta kit, but I'm not, I think it's the first one on the list, but I'm not 100% positive on that. Okay. I mean, obviously we make these public and they these would be public. available. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So at this time, I don't have any additional questions here, but uh, I'll give people a minute or two if they want to type something in. Well, I don't know about two minutes, but the uh, this is a great opportunity to ask questions. Garrett has a ton of experience doing this, both uh, in vivo and in vitro. Um, so if you have any questions that you think will help you with your experiment, it's a great time to ask. All right. Um, it doesn't look like we have anything else specific here. Uh, okay. I guess with that, um, 
we'll wrap this up. Garrett, uh, that was a great presentation. These were great questions. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody. Uh, let's see here. Hold on. Let's throw in this one last question here. Can you comment on shRNA design and do you convert siRNA sequence? Comment on siRNA design? shRNA design. Oh. <laughs> One thing that I can say is we don't support shRNA design and we haven't for quite some time. But then converting the siRNA sequence, I mean, I think we could help with that, certainly. Sure. If um, someone had an shRNA of interest and wanted to convert it to a dsRNA, we could definitely help with that. Right. So, okay, now I will wrap this up. I will say, if you do have any more questions, uh, a great resource is to contact our customer care, you know, and somebody knowledgeable on the subject will get back to you. Uh, you know, are very responsive to those those kinds of requests. And uh, Garrett, can you pull up that uh, slide? It's your second to the last slide that has sure. the customer care address on it. And it's at the bottom of that slide. It's customer care at idtdna.com. So if you have any more specific questions or you want help, you know, additional help on any of these, feel free to contact them. Uh, Garrett, great presentation, great questions, and very nice discussion. Um, this is one of a series of webinars that we'll be doing on RNAi, next generation sequencing, qPCR, all these webinars. We record them and we post them on our website. So that's at www.idtdna.com. And you can find that under our support and education tab. We also have all a series of videos on our YouTube channel, which is www.youtube.com forward slash IDTDNA bio. And with that, I would definitely like to thank everybody for attending today and for the great questions and wish you the best of luck in your research. Thank you very much.